So here we are, we are carrying on this series, this is week four, I think if you've missed any of them you can catch up on our YouTube channel or through finchamsted.com, all the information is there for you. Um, and you know, basically what we're doing is, we've, since Easter, we've been exploring or following on um, in, uh, stories of people who met Jesus after Jesus had been um, crucified, after he came back to life. We're exploring the encounters that a bunch of people had with Jesus when they saw that he was alive again. And the thing that we've noticed as we've gone throughout this, this series is each of these people, each of these encounters had a dramatic impact on, uh, on their lives, unsurprisingly. I mean, we'd expect that to happen. Uh, they saw that Jesus was alive, but something happened in them, and they discovered fullness of life and, and followed Jesus into this, uh, uh, this new phase of life uh, and ministry, um, and you know, their lives were transformed. But also, every single one of them were, was influential in helping other people encounter the risen Jesus and to discover what it means for them to be alive as well. So we're picking up that series, we're carrying it on, we're going to look at another encounter um, of somebody who met Jesus after he died and came back to life again. But before we do that, let me just ask you this question. What is the most embarrassing thing you have ever done? What's the most embarrassing thing you've ever done? So we're going to start over here, Magdalene, with you, and then we're going to go all the way around the room. Uh, and no, not up for that? Okay, maybe not. But just think about, think about that. I'm sure you have done something that's embarrassing, that maybe makes you cringe or you go, <laughs> like this shiver, and um, you think, why did I do that? Why did I say that? Uh, whatever it is. We've all got, we've all got those, those moments. Let me share one of my embarrassing moments. Not the most embarrassing moment. I'm not going to share that one with you, uh, but I will share this one with you. Um, and it's to do with golf. I love to play golf. Uh, and I was playing golf a couple of years ago um, at a local golf course called San Martins. And the round was all right. I mean, uneventful. Uh, but on the last hole, um, the 18th hole, we were coming up to the, the green. Um, and I was sort of out position and I needed to smack this ball as far and as hard as I could to stand any chance of getting it onto the green. And, and at San Martins, you've got this the green here, and then you've got a little hill, and then you've got like pavement, a path, and then you've got the clubhouse. And it was a nice summer's evening, and by the clubhouse, uh, there's a patio area, and people are sitting outside having their drinks and all this sort of stuff, and I'm sure you can imagine what's happening. So I'm sort of out of position, I'm on the right of the fairway, and I take my, my full hybrid, if you know what that is, and I wind up, and I get hold of this ball like nothing else and it just flies and flies and starts heading off towards the green I'm like yes yes this is it it's going to go in I'm going to get an eagle and everything and then it starts to turn left and it keeps going and it keeps going and it starts heading towards the pavement and the patio area and the clubhouse and I'm like ah what's happening and it goes out of sight behind a bush I hear it bounce off the pavement and then all the next thing I hear is smash as this ball goes into the clubhouse window and breaks the window. And, and I walk out, the people I'm with um, sort of abandon me because um, they don't want to be associated with me. I have to walk up. There's people on there who are having a right go at me, like saying, what were you doing? I'm like, I didn't aim for that. I wasn't trying to do this. And I had to go into the clubhouse and into the pro shop and say, I'm really sorry, I broke the window. Uh, and it was quite embarrassing. The worst thing was we were playing there again a couple of days later um, and we had breakfast in the clubhouse and the window was still broken, and the people that I was with kept drawing attention to the window and saying he was the one who broke it. Um, I mean, it wasn't my finest moment um, on the golf course um, at all. But, you know, I, I think this, that, that example is sort of like a metaphor um, for life. You know, often we're, we're trying our best, we're trying to go straight, um, we're trying to do the best we can, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, disaster hits. We steer off course, and we end up breaking something or, or someone. How many times have we been in a situation where we're just trying to do um, our best, we're just trying to get through life and then a bad choice or a bad decision or, or whatever happens and actually we end up hurting people, we end up breaking something or something goes wrong. It can be embarrassing, it can be uh, difficult and actually the word that you would associate um, with that golf shot would be fail. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a great uh, moment and you know, 
embarrassing stories is one thing, sharing moments of, of when we've done something that's embarrassing, but, but what about when we have failed? What about when we've got it wrong? So, Max Lynn, again, if you're ready to share. Um, no, okay, we're, we're not going to get anywhere uh, with this, but just think about that. You know, yeah, of course you can share those sort of moments when you've done something and you're embarrassed by it, but, but what about when you've failed, when you've made a big mistake where, where you've got it wrong? The only guarantee in life is that we will fail, that we will make mistakes, that we will mess up. We do it in all aspects of life, and I'm sure you can think of things. I'm sure things come um, to mind for you when you think about this. You know, where, where have you messed up at home? Where have you got it wrong? Where have you failed uh, there or at work? What about here um, in church? Where have you done something or, or it's gone wrong or you said something and you've offended somebody or, or at school or with your neighbors or on the golf course or, or whatever it is? You know, we all fail. We all make mistakes. Mistakes. We all have those moments in life where we look at ourselves and we think about what we've done and, and we don't feel like a success. We feel like a failure. Am I encouraging you this morning? Am I lifting you up this week? Like, I'm so glad I got out of bed for this, Chris. Thank you very much. You know, this is, it's all part of life, isn't it? Failure is part of life. But let me tell you this, whilst failure and failing and getting it wrong is part of life, it isn't the fullness of life that you were created for, that God has better things in store for you. So this morning, I want to take a look uh, or a closer look at the story of somebody who who understands what it is to fail. They're, they've done amazing things, but when we look through um, their story, we can see that it's littered with mistakes. It's, it's littered with failure, and it's this guy called Peter. Peter was one um, of Jesus' closest friends. He was one of the, the 12 disciples, and you know, Peter's done amazing things. The, the fact that 2,000 years on, we're still talking about him uh, is amazing. He was from like a nowhere place. Uh, he wasn't really an important person until he encountered Jesus. Peter was a fisherman, and that was okay. Um, it was sort of like an average job. It wasn't the best. It certainly wasn't the worst. You know, he would have probably owned his, um, the boats and the net and the fishing gear, and that sort of gave him a status and a credibility in society. But it was quite a messy job, uh, quite a smelly job, uh, and, and that, that's Peter. And one day he encounters Jesus, and you might know the story. Basically, Jesus is speaking to a large group of people, and he gets into Peter's boat, um, and he says, just move out a little bit, and he carries on speaking to the crowd. And then he says to them, um, Can go back out to sea, and, and let's set your nets out for a catch. And they said, well, we've, we've fished all night. We've not caught anything. But they recognize something in Jesus. Said, but because you ask, we'll do it. So they set out to sea, and, and Jesus says, put your nets over this side. And they put the nets over this side of the boat, and they bring in the biggest catch of fish that they've ever had. And Peter sees something in Jesus in that moment. He says, go away from me, Lord, because I'm a sinful man. And they go back into shore. They bring the nets on, and, and uh, uh, Jesus um, looks at Peter. His name's Simon at this point, and he changes his name um, to Peter. He gives him this name, which means rock and all of those sort of stuff. And he says to him, from now on, you will be fishers of men. And, you know, Peter uh, leaves everything, this biggest catch that he's ever had. He leaves it on the beach and he goes off and he follows Jesus. And as you read through the Gospels and you see some of the things that um, Peter does. You know, I really like Peter. He, he makes loads of mistakes. He's, he's impetuous. He seems to act before thinking. Uh, and he's got that desire and that hunger and that zeal, but it can get him into trouble. Um, sometimes. And, you know, we're, we're going to pick up the story after the, the crucifixion and resurrection of, of Jesus. And Peter's just made a bunch of mistakes recently. You know, if this was a job, his appraisal would have a bunch of things for him to work on. There's things like um, he overpromised and he underdelivered. Jesus said, all of you will fall away. And Peter says, no, I will never fall away. And he, and he says, you know, even if this lot, even if these other disciples fall away, I will never never fall away. I will never abandon you. I will never desert you. And then, uh, not much long after that, he denies knowing Jesus. Um, he's three times people ask him, you know, you're one of Jesus' followers, aren't you? And three times he denies knowing Jesus. Um, when Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane and, and he's praying and he wants Peter and the other disciples to keep watch with him, to pray with him. Peter can't stay awake. He keeps falling asleep. And then when Jesus gets arrested, um, Peter grabs a sword and he chops off the ear of one of the guards. And you know, Jesus has to heal him and restore that, that ear. Um, and then later on as Jesus is being crucified, 
Peter's nowhere to be seen. He's gone into hiding like the rest of the disciples have. So, you know, things aren't going great um, for, for Peter um, at the moment. And, and there's news that Jesus is alive again, that he's been back. And they've, they've, sort of, they've seen him, they've encountered him. But Peter's still probably thinking about all of these mistakes uh, that he's made. He's still thinking about how he let his closest friend, his Messiah, um, down, how he abandoned him. How do you think Peter feels right now in this moment? Well, like a failure, like many of us can associate with that. So we're going to pick up the story there. We're going to read um, John's version um, of, of what happens next. So it says this. So afterward, Jesus appeared again. So again, so he's appeared to them before, to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. And it happened this way. Simon Peter... Thomas, also known as Didymus because he was small, and Nathaniel, that's a joke by the way, you can laugh, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I love that bit. So they list these people, you know, Thomas gets his uh, two names, and there's the two other disciples. Don't you feel really sorry for them? You know, who are, who, oh, you're the two other disciples, they don't, they don't even get named. Anyway, and they were all together, and you know, I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. So why does Peter go back to fishing? You know, this is his career um, before Jesus called him to follow, follow them, and, and it seems he just, he goes back to fishing. You know, well, perhaps it's because they still needed an income, so perhaps they still fished, and they still did those things to support them um, through, through that time. But, you know, I think, I think there's something more going on um, in this. Yes, they, they know that Jesus is alive again, and they, they've met him, they've had this encounter with him, but, but something's still different, certainly um, for Peter. I think the weight of his faith is resting on his shoulders and perhaps he's not sure what to do so he goes back to what he knows he goes back to the beginning he goes back to where he was before this all started before he met Jesus he goes back to the familiar place of fishing and you know we only hear about two times where Peter fishes in the Bible both times he catches nothing Peter is rubbish at fishing. Now, this is why Jesus came to him and says, come and, and follow me. So, so they catch nothing um, again. And the, as we'll see, there seems to be echoes of what happened all, um, all those years ago, or three years ago, when, when he first met Jesus and he first had this encounter with Jesus. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. I mean, that's a recurring theme throughout this whole series. Time and time again, people encounter Jesus and they don't realize that it's Jesus. And, and whether that's because he's supernaturally been um, withheld from, the, from them from understanding or because they're not expecting him, or, or whatever, but this is the case. Jesus is there, and they don't realize that it's him. And just pause there just for a moment. I'm sure there's many moments in life where we encounter Jesus, not in the same way, you know, he's not physically standing on a beach, but we're in places and we encounter that Jesus is at work. And we don't realize that it's him. You know, Jesus turns up in unexpected places at unexpected times and he does unexpected things. And if we have a narrow-minded view or expectation of who Jesus is and what Jesus is about and what Jesus does, there'll be many moments in life where we miss that he's at work and he's he's on the move. Anyway, that's a slight distraction. They didn't realize that it was Jesus. And he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. And I wonder if Jesus gives a little um, chuckle to himself um, at this moment because he's been here before as well you know when he first met them and they hadn't caught um, any fish at, at, at all and he says to them well set your set your nets out on the other side of the boat this is a deja vu moment they've been here uh, before so they do that and all of a sudden they haul it in this massive catch of fish again this big huge catch just like the one before when Jesus first met Peter and and Peter realizes that it's Jesus and he said it's the Lord and, and he he takes his coat this is a funny thing John tells us he takes his coat because he's taking it off and he wraps it around himself and he jumps in to the water I don't understand why he puts his coat off 
on to go swimming. Uh, and he swims to get to Jesus whilst the others row to shore and drag the, the fish on. And you know, again, we see the impetuous nature of Jesus, um, of Peter. He just wants to get to be close to Jesus. He sees him on the beach and his desire and his hunger um, to get to him, that he just jumps in. He doesn't want to wait for the boat. And he swims there and then he climbs up dripping wet and he walks onto the beach and he walks up uh, to Jesus and he sees that, that Jesus has got um, a fire lit and he says, bring some of the fish. And the others, they get the boat on and they drag the net and they grab some fish and they pull it on the coals and they have breakfast um, together. Um, you know, this amazing encounter, this amazing moment when they're just sitting and like, oh, Jesus is there, he's in front of us, we're having breakfast. He was dead and, and he's alive again. And then after, after breakfast, they, Jesus and Peter have this, this conversation which we'll go through. But um, just imagine you're Peter again and, and you've not had a chance to talk about what's happened. And, and you know, you're about to have this conversation uh, with Jesus. What, what's going through your heart? What's going through your mind at this moment? You know, what do you think Jesus is going to say? How is he going to react? I think a part of Peter must be thinking that, that Jesus is going to reject him or turn his back on him or tell him off or condemn him um, at least. Well, let's take a look at the conversation. So when they'd finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon... Son of John, do you love me more than these? And, you know, this is a really interesting thing, really interesting question. I mean, it's interesting that, that Jesus is calling Peter Simon. He's taken him back to the name that he had before he met him, before he asked him to, to follow him. Um, and perhaps, you know, he's doing that. Perhaps he's taking him back to the beginning, just as Peter has gone back to the beginning by going fishing Maybe Jesus is doing the same. Maybe Jesus has given him this opportunity to, to realize and, and to start um, again. And he says to them, do you love me more than these? Well, well what these? You know, what, what's he talking um, a, a, about? You know, there's perhaps three options that Jesus is talking about there. He says, do you love me more than you love the other disciples? Or do you love me more than you love all this fishing stuff? You know, and maybe pointing to the nets and all the fish. Do you love me more than that? Or do you love me more than they love me? Well, we're not totally sure which one it is. I think it's probably the first um, or, or, or the third. But the thing about this conversation is I think the other disciples are there. I think, you know, maybe they're still around the fire. And, and Jesus says to, to Simon, in front of everybody, do you love me? more than these. And that's appropriate because actually if we go back to that time when Jesus says, you will all abandon me, and, and Peter says, no Lord, even if these abandon you, even they abandon you, I will never abandon you. You know, publicly, he sort of puts himself up. He elevates himself above the rest of the disciples. And I think, again, publicly, Jesus is taking him through this conversation. And, and Peter's response is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now, um, if you're a biblical scholar and you read Greek and all those sort of things, as I'm sure we all do on a Sunday afternoon, we go and get our Greek Bibles and read through these things. You might know that um, there's different words for love in the Greek language. We just have one word uh, for love, but they have different words that sort of describe different aspects um, of love. And some people comment that, um, so if we go back to this word, you know, do you love me? In the, in the, if you read a Greek Bible, the word that Jesus uses there is agape, which we we often use to think about, well, this means sort of like sacrificial love. This is complete selfless love. You know, Jesus, um, Simon, do you agape me? Do you, do you sacrificially love me? And what Peter says here is, yes, Lord, you know that I love you, but he uses filio, which is sort of like um, brotherly love, Philadelphia. Um, you know, that city of Philadelphia the, the, yeah, um, comes from, from that, that word. And some people are commenting that, um, you know, what well, Jesus is saying, do you sacrificially love me? And, and Peter says, yes, Lord, I I love you like a, like a friend, uh, and that he's not able to love Jesus to the same degree um, as Jesus loves him. And actually, you know what? I'm not sure, and um, I say that I'm not sure, I'm not a biblical scholar, but other people have commented um, on this. And so some people say, yeah, there's a lot to be read into that. Other people say, no, because when you look through the use of the word love in John's gospel, he seems to use it interchangeably. That when Jesus is talking, sometimes, often he uses agape, but sometimes he uses filio. 
um, as well. So I don't know. You can think about that for yourself. You know, is Jesus doing something more here? Um, I'm not sure what he is. I think it's, um, you know, John's using those words interchangeably. And he says, but uh, yeah, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says, feed my lambs. Now, this is an interesting thing. You know, wh- what does that, that mean? Now, for us, thousands of years on, we sort of understand this. You know, Jesus is, is giving um, Peter a, pas- a pastoral job to do. And again, thousands of years on, when we hear the word pastoral, we think about church ministry or caring. You know, there's pastoral ministry or pastoral jobs within schools and, and those sort of things. But in this context, pastoral work was to do with shepherding. It was to doing with looking after animals and caring uh, for those things. And, that's, and we've taken that on from verses like that and applied it to sort of caring for others and those things because of what Jesus is saying here. And, you know, he's saying, I want you to feed my lambs. And again, we could read a lot into that, and I'm sure there is stuff going on there. But the key word here, for me, is my. That, that Jesus is saying to Peter, I want you to feed my, my lambs, not yours, my lambs. And, you know, Peter's in this place of failure. He's in this place of, like, wondering what's going to happen. He's, he's messed up. And, he, and Jesus says, do you love me? He says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. I think Jesus is saying, look, you still have a job to do here. You still have a part to play um, in, uh, in my work. You know, Jesus is commissioning Peter again to be part of his kingdom, to be part of his plans and purposes. And as we read on, again, Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. You know, it's the same question, and it's the same answer, and the same response. And there's a little bit difference here. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Now he's saying, take care of my sheep. You know, is something else going on here? Does that mean something else? Again, some people will say, well, lambs to sheep sort of marks a progression in maturity. So is he telling him something else? Again, I don't know. Um, but what I do know is my is there. I think that's the key word that Jesus is saying to Peter. I want you to be part of the plans and purposes that I have for my church and for my kingdom and I want you to be part um, of that. And then the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? You know, Jesus asked him three times in front of other people. And how's Peter starting to feel? You know, surely this is linked to the three times that Peter denied knowing Jesus, you know. And I'm sure this was a difficult moment for Peter that as he's facing um, just what he's done, um, as he's coming face to face with Jesus and realizing his failure and his mistake. Um, and it says Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. You know, I think what's going on here is that Jesus is allowing Peter to respond with a declaration of love for each moment where he denied knowing him. I think that Jesus is giving Peter space to deal with his mistake, to to be confronted by it, to own it, and to move on before it. And three times we get this instruction, you know, um, feed my lambs, take care of my sheep, um, feed my sheep. And again, you know, as you said, you can read into the feed and take care and sheep and lambs, and maybe there is something in there. But I think the important thing is Jesus is saying, I've still got a job for you. You still have a part to play uh, in my kingdom. I want you to be part of the plans and the purposes that I have for you and for this world. And Peter, at this point, is probably starting to feel a bit better about himself. I think, okay, you know, things are okay. Uh, And then Jesus says this. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you dressed yourself and you went where you wanted. I love that, you dressed yourself. I wish my kids would do that when they were younger. But when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. And Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. And then he said to him, follow me. You know, what an amazing thing. He sort of seems everything to be okay. And then he says, you know, there will become a time when you will have to go where you do not want to go. But I pictured Jesus then standing before him and holding out his hand and saying, follow me. And Peter's left with a choice, just as he was right at the beginning. You know, when he had that amazing catch of fish and, and Jesus says to him, follow me. Peter was left with a choice then. Do I leave all this behind and get up and follow you? And he did. And he became, you know, I said, I'll make you fishers of men. And again, Jesus gives him that same invitation, that same calling. And this is Peter's first calling. Above 
all the taking care of sheep and lambs and feeding and all that sort of stuff, his first calling is to follow Jesus. And Jesus has told him that this is what it will involve for you. Um, And there's loads of amazing stuff that happens uh, from this point onwards. As you flick through the pages of the New Testament, you see Peter doing amazing stuff. Uh, And we don't actually, um, in uh, in the Bible, discover about Peter's death, but folklore tells us that he was crucified upside down, and and he did that because he he didn't want to be crucified in the same way that Jesus was, so they crucified him upside down. That he suffered, and he had this brutal um, death. Jesus is telling him in this moment, you know, if you follow me, it's going to be difficult. There's going to be challenges, but I'll be with you, you know, and and Peter is left with that that moment. Is he going to do that? Is he going to take up that mantle? Is he going to pick up his cross and follow Jesus into that? And, you know, we know that he does and amazing things happen. You know, this is is a key moment in the life of Peter. This is a turning point for him where he's able to deal with his mistake uh, and move on. And, you know, Peter isn't defined by this failure that he's had. It's forgiven, it's forgotten, and they move forward. This is something amazing that that Jesus does, that even though Peter denies him and abandons him, it doesn't define him. It doesn't shape him. He's not, he's not Peter the failure. He's not Peter the guy who denied knowing Jesus. He's not Peter the guy who turned his back on, on Jesus. He, he meets with Jesus and Jesus gives him space to come face to face with his failure. But then he forgives him and then he forgets about it. You know, he, he, he forgives him of what he's done and then forgets about it so that they can move forward and that's a picture of the forgiveness that we receive from God and I'm sure you can think about your failure the stuff that's that's in your life the things that you have done wrong and you know our story is not the same as Peter but there's but there's loads of overlaps there's loads of similarities we've all made mistakes we've all let Jesus down if you're a follower of Jesus and if you're not a follower of Jesus you there's stuff you've done in your life that you're not proud of that you wish you could go back and undo your your past is littered with failure I'm sure it is But Jesus gives us this opportunity to actually be forgiven uh, from that. And as he forgives us from that, he forgets about it. Now, whether we forget about it or not is another thing, uh, but but Jesus does. And he makes makes it possible for us to be moved, to to move forward. And, And Peter does. He moves forward and he's influential. He's instrumental in the spread of this new movement and the the explosion of the church and thousands of people coming to faith um, in in Jesus. His life is completely transformed. Excuse me. Why? You know, what's happened? Just moments ago, he was afraid of a teenage girl when they said, you're a follower of Jesus. Moments ago, he was carrying in a room with the other disciples because they were afraid of what would happen, what happened to Jesus would happen to them. And, and, uh, you know, this changes. They, they publicly and boldly declare their faith in Jesus and that Jesus is alive. Why? What's changed? Well, simply, Peter has encountered the risen Jesus. His friend was dead and he's alive again and he's standing before him. And that does something in him. But more than that, Peter's encountered the grace and the forgiveness that his God has for him. He knows he's messed up. He knows he's failed. But Jesus gently and graciously um, restores him. Uh, and this, this, is, this is the difference, this is the impact uh, that it has on Peter's life. And his life is changed. And I love what Jesus does in this story that this three times, do you love me? Um, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. I think this is obviously more for Peter than it is for Jesus. That Jesus knows that Peter needs to deal with his mistakes in order for him to move forward, in order for him to have a chance to forget uh, about it. And Jesus graciously leads Peter into that place that is uncomfortable and difficult and leads him through so that Peter can move forward. And he does the same for each and every one of us if we're willing to let him. So where have you messed up? What comes to mind? What's the biggest thing um, right now? What's that failure um, or that regret that you're carrying uh, around with you. We're going to start over here with Sarah this time and go, no, okay, we won't, we won't do that. But I'm sure there's stuff. Um, just bring it to mind. Bring it to the center. Bring it into your heart uh, and just allow it to sit there and allow the uncomfortableness of that failure 
just to sit with you. And maybe that's hurt other people and there's pain and th- those sort of things. How do we, how do we move forward uh, from this? How, how do we move forward so, so this failure doesn't define us? Yeah, we can learn from it and it can shape us, but it doesn't describe or define who we are. Well, simply, first of all, we've got to own it. We've got to admit it, not, not pass the blame onto other people, not make excuses, well, I needed it because they did that, you know, which we all have a tendency to do. Where is your failure? Where, where have you messed it up? Own it. Own your slice of the blame pie. You know, if you think about, about a, a pie chart, you know, and maybe there's a big part that is someone else's fault, but what's your slice? There's a part that's dependent on, on you. Own it. Admit it. Let yourself know. Just be honest to yourself. Put your hand up to yourself and say, yeah, I did that. I said that. I thought that. I bought that. I went there. I made that mistake. And again, and again, and again. Whatever it is for you, just own it. Admit it. Don't pass the blame. Don't make excuses. Own what you have done and just sit in that place of uncomfortableness for a while. And then confess it. You know, let God know that you know that you've messed up. Because he knows. So you don't have to inform him, oh God, I'm really sorry I've done this. It's not like kids going to their parents when they don't know uh, what they've done wrong. He knows. Um, So just let him know that you know that, that you've made a mistake and that you're sorry for it. And then this might be the more difficult one. Let whoever else needs to know that you know and that you're sorry. You know, if you've hurt somebody else in this process, if your mistake or, or failure or whatever it is has impacted somebody else and you haven't done this, you haven't gone to them and said, I'm sorry for that. You know, you, you, you can't own it and, and as part of that, you've not even owned it if you've not done that. So you have to confess it to God um, and to other people um, around you. And then thirdly, simply, repent from it. You know, repent, um, repent isn't the same as saying sorry. We often think repentance is just like, oh God, I'm sorry for this, and he forgives us, and then we carry on, we do the same thing again. That's not what repentance is. You know, repentance um, was a word uh, that the military used to use, and, you know, if they were marching this way, they'd say, repent, and they turn, and they walk away in the opposite direction. So to repent from something means moving away from it. It means putting things in place that stops you being in whatever that is. So if, if the thing that you're thinking about, if the thing where you've messed up is a recurring habit, and for many people that's a thing that they just struggle with, to repent isn't to say sorry and to stay in that place. To, to repent is to put safeguards in place that stops you going there um, and having the temptation or whatever it is. So, so own it, confess it, and, and repent from it. Put things in place that will help you not make that same mistake again uh, and, and to deal with it and to move forward. And when we do that, just like Peter, we're able to receive forgiveness from God. And the amazing thing is that when he forgives us, he forgets it. He chooses to forget it. He chooses not to hold it against us any longer. And I often picture the thing like maybe, you know, I go to God and, oh, you know that thing where I messed up over there and he's like, no, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about, Chris. No, oh, come on, you know, I've done it multiple times and no, I don't know about that. Because when he forgives us, he forgets it. He doesn't hold it against us any longer. And he enables us to move forward beyond it, to be free from it. And that's what we see in the life of Peter, that Jesus sets him free from his past. He sets him free from his present, and he gives him that freedom to live into his future. It wasn't comfortable for him, but it was necessary, and it was transformative. And if you want to do what Jesus wants to do the same to you and with you, that, that past mistake and that past failure, he wants to help you own it, confess it, repent from it, and move forward so it doesn't define you any longer. You know, Jesus doesn't think any less of you because of your failure. He didn't think any less of Peter, um, but he doesn't want you to stay in that place. Yes, he might take you back there just as he did uh, with Peter to help him deal with it, but he wants to help you move forward. And the way he does that is through the same way that he did with Peter. And it's simply by offering you that same invitation, follow me. It's not our mistakes that define us. It's what we do with them that counts. You know, following Jesus means we deal with our mistakes. 
We're going to get the band back on as, as we wrap up uh, this time um, together. And, and, but so just think about that for the moment. I hope there's something that comes to mind. Well, maybe there's not something that comes to mind for you because you've dealt with it and moved forward. I hope that's the case. But, but if that isn't true, just, just be aware of that and, let, let, and deal with that. I think God wants to, you to be able to deal with that um, this morning. That it's not rocket science. It doesn't take um, lots of time necessarily, but it does take a right attitude to be able to do that. And Jesus offers that same invitation to you that he offered um, to, to Peter. He says, follow me, um, and he's, you know, will you accept it? Follow me isn't just believing in Jesus and then going about your rest of your life. Following me, when Jesus says follow me, he doesn't mean I'll just come to church on a Sunday and maybe a small group and, okay, if you could be part of a volunteer team, then that, that's great. You know, that might be part of some of that stuff, but that's not what he's talking about. To follow me means that your life is orientated towards him. And remember the thing that Jesus said to Peter afterwards? He says, you know, you used to go where you want to do and do what you want to do, but I tell you that a time will come when someone else will take you by the hand and lead you to a place you don't want to go. Now, that might not be the case for us, but following Jesus does cost us something. It costs change. Um, It costs a willingness to actually be devoted to him and live our lives the way that he would. It costs us that that, that place of actually thinking, well, God, what is it that you want me to do in this place, in this moment? And when we make a mistake, it costs us because he wants us to own it, to confess it, to repent from it so that we can move forward. You know, Peter encountered Jesus after he was dead and he (laughs) was alive again and had this transformation. He's free uh, from it. His life has renewed purpose. His life has a renewed passion. His life has renewed meaning. But it's not easy. It's not, not comfortable. And, but I'm sure that even as Peter hung on that cross upside down, he wouldn't trade any of it. Because that invitation that his Lord and his Savior and his friend extended to him was worth the cost that he paid for it. You know, you can live in this freedom too if you're willing to follow Jesus with your life and with your mistakes. Why don't we stand to our feet? And just think about the stuff that we, we've talked about. Maybe there's stuff, maybe God through his Holy Spirit is prompting you and, and poking you and prodding you about those things in your life, that past failure that's defining you and restricting you. And you're not able to move on. You're not able to forget it um, because of the pain you've caused yourself or the pain that you've caused other people. I believe that God wants to help you uh, in that. And that might not be easy, but you can move forward. Let's pray together. Father God, we stand before you as a bunch of people who uh, get it wrong. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. And I thank you that you know that. I thank you that you knew that before you called us to follow you. And I thank you that our mistakes don't define us and they don't restrict the love that you help for us. Lord, help us move beyond. Help us own it, admit it. Help us to confess it to you and to the people that we need to do. Help us to repent from it, to put things in place, to safeguard ourselves and safeguard other people, to remove ourselves from that temptation or that sin or that mistake or that failure. And then help us to forget it so that we can move forward into the things that you have for us. I thank you that you invite us to follow you. Lord, give us the courage to do that. Not just to believe in you and go about the rest of our lives, but to orientate our lives around you, to put you front and center so that everything we do is done for you, with you at work in us. Bless us, Lord, I pray.